When I came here about six months ago, I already thought that Estonia was a good example for Jersey to look at, uh, not only in terms of what it's done using technology to improve government, but also to, in terms of how it's developed the local technology sector. If you look at some of the uh, successful companies that started off in Estonia, so Skype's an obvious one, TransferWise, a lot of others that I'm forgetting right now, but I think you've got them in one of your slides. Um, I thought it was a great place for us to look at. I was very pleased when I came here to see that Jersey had already been talking to Estonia, but I think there's a lot more things we can do together. Because I think, as well as looking at the technology sector overall, I think eGov, if we do it right, can be a huge opportunity for Jersey. Because it's a win-win-win. A you know, more efficient government, improved services for citizens, and again, done in the right way, a good driver of digital businesses and new digital jobs here in Jersey. All right. Well, it's been a long day, uh, probably for you as well. So, uh, the more I'm happy to see you guys here and exactly a few familiar faces already. Uh, let me just figure out what's the best way so that everybody can see me. Is it here rather? I think it's a bit better. Okay. Um, so, I don't want to do like a long lecture of sorts, but rather just, uh, I think, just start off with just a bit of background and, and, and teasers, if you wish. Um, and actually, at the, uh, having said that, I mean, at, at any point, feel free, to, feel free to interrupt me a bit. So if they want to clarify something immediately, we'll have a discussion in the end anyway, right? But uh, something right away, just shoot away, okay? But to start us off, um, I think Tony actually gave you the pitch that I was going to do. So, you know, one of the merits of digital government in a way. <laughs> um, I can just only echo these three things he said. But before, I just want to say one thing. I mean, um, yes, I work on all things digital. So even if the core of that is working on digital government, so how do we use technology? I mean, actually, our sort of approach and sort of strategy and sort of the stuff we do has a wider ambition. That's really the society. So the stuff we do by putting in place the platforms that I will talk about, the stuff we do also on the policy side, it's really aimed at, you know, okay, everybody in Estonia, in their sectors, whatever they do, in their lives, to be enabled by digital sort of solutions. So not just the government, how we operate, but also actually beyond. We, we, we do it for the whole of whole of society. And so we started actually 15 or more years ago uh, from the government side. So we already had the luck that we also, like here, uh, had a financial industry a bit driving the way. So uh, this is you know, early 90s, who doesn't know the history, then very st short history lesson. Early 90s, we basically rebooted the country after the Soviet Union fell apart. So we had a chance that you know, we could build from scratch in all areas of life. And for financial sector, that meant that they just skipped all the old stages and went online banking right away. So that started building up like a user base that a few years later, us from the government decided to tap into and start moving our services online for people's benefit and, you know, do more with IT in the back office of ours to be more efficient like that. And so the, when we really talk about, okay, so what do we have seen happening? I said, promise to re reiterate the three things Tony mentioned. So first of all, we're clearly seeing a digital, doing things digitally allows us to deliver better services uh, for, the, for people and companies for that matter. So the reason these guys are here, so that's an average Estonian so Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> so we do like to go to sauna a lot, right? Uh, because we are also a very Nordic country, but so it's long in the sort of tradition in the countries around there, us and the Finns. But the other point is that that used to be a place of business or doing business. So we're sort of sealing the deals. These days you don't have to go to sauna for that. You can be anywhere in the world and basically sign a deal or start your company for that matter. So basically, if you want to start a company, you go online, in the next few hours you're legally up and running after the application is submitted. We just basically streamline the whole service with digital connections between agencies in the back end. Uh, or the other example, um, you know, once your company is up and running, all the reports, all the red tape, you can get done online. Again, easy, nice, efficient ways. And ease and efficient are really the keywords. So this is what we've seen that we can deliver to the people a more efficient and easy life with help of digital services. So the example, other one I can give you is that um, tax declarations for physical uh, persons. Usually people hate doing taxes, right? Everybody does. In the Estonian case, we are a bit weird because we don't mind or, or some people even love it because it's a very easy affair for us. In our case, a tax declaration is, takes you five minutes if you're slow. So the point is that in our case, as taxes are withheld through the year, we present the data back to the people. So basically for them, tax declaration is previewing of a pre-filled declaration. So yeah, next, 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 submit, they're done, right? The taxes are done. They know that they get the reimbursement back, for example. So the point is again, that's something they have to do. 
So we might as well do it kind of easy for them, right? So they wouldn't have to spend time and money and, well, there's no accountants involved. There's, um, we don't know the term tax lawyer in Estonia because, again, there's no need for that. So the point is, okay, we can make lives easier and efficient. But the other point is that it means a lot for the government too. So that's the second point that, uh, that Tony raised. In Estonia, um, it might sound funny to you, but we are also very small. <laughs> so with 1.3 million people, you know, in the big scale of things, you know, we are uh, tiny. Just like, well, in that sense, just like Jersey here, uh, compared to many of the neighbors of ours. So the point is, 1.3 million people, no natural resources, but still wants to be a country, and we don't want to have high taxes. So our thinking of the, of the leaders was that, okay, late 90s, this is what I'm talking about, so this internet thing is taking off. Could this be a solution? How to be really efficient and, you know, with, with the little money that we're raising? And so we started experimenting on several fronts, and it happened that actually, yes, we could be very efficient, cost efficiency-wise, but also deliver more for the money we, we um, you know, basically gather. So the examples I have here is, you know, very simple thing from police. Uh, if, you, if you have heard this already, basically, there's so many things we could do with analytics, for example, right? We did something even more simple. Um, we gave police patrols access to uh, databases. So in on the street, while they're patrolling, they just got an uh, internet hook device. They can basically run background checks, for example, on the spot. That's 10 years ago. So immediately, in just a few months, we had a very sort of strong increase in sort of lost, stolen cars being found, cases being solved. They were doing their job much better just because they had information access right there. And you know, when we had analytics and other stuff, that it became even more powerful. Well, the other example I, I don't have it here, but um, our cabinet, so our minister, council of ministers, um, their whole decision making happens online. Oh, sorry, enabled by online on solution. They still physically meet. Uh, but the point is, because of that, because of all the decision making, you know, from a point when a law is started up to when it becomes, you know, sent to the parliament, happens electronically. They save time. So for ministers, and this is a random, very small, tiny bit, but just to show you. So it used to be that our cabinet sessions were four or five hours. People debating all the stuff through and, you know, going on and on. Now, 30, 40 minutes. Because again, digitally, all the sort of preparatory work is done much more in advance. And so basically they save time because, you know, they just only talk about the things that they have to. If the way it works is that ministers, if they're the night before, say that, okay, I don't know, out of these five agenda points, the three are okay by me. And if everybody agrees, these don't, don't get discussed. Back in the day, you had to talk everything through, present stuff. So, random example perhaps to you, but even on, on that level, we can get efficiencies. And when we then add to that, what we can do in back office and sort of front office stuff, this is massive. And the third part, uh, sorry, third part, is that um, indeed we have seen a very strong growth uh, dividend coming for the private sector side, so I'll focus on this. So we made a very early on a, a strong decision. We will not build the solutions ourselves. The backdrop to that was that, well, first of all, yeah, we couldn't really afford to get the good tech guys on our payroll. But secondly, we thought, okay, but this could be an industry development measure. So through procurement, we started basically working with the industry that, first of all, that we would get better solutions because, again, we cannot have all the expertise in-house. But secondly, um, that allowed the companies to gain uh, expertise. And the other part was that, well, we weren't buying, we didn't want to buy uh, off-the-shelf stuff. We bought custom-made stuff. So that meant that, you know, there was a lot of, let's say, competitive advantage that uh, local uh, companies could bring to the game. So there was no way we could favor the local guys, but that's exactly through buying value for money and custom-made stuff, we basically were able to work with them. And, and out of that, then uh, we got the momentum going. So these days, e-Estonia actually is very much a brand developed by, uh, by the companies in order to take this expertise abroad now to other countries. And the other part we got, as we were sort of gaining expertise, uh, these companies and experts started bringing their know-how to other sectors. So now we are lucky to have a very active uh, startup community. Yes, TransferWise was mentioned, for example, these days and, and some others. We even put some of them on, on stamps. These are physical stamps <laughs> because we're so proud of them. So, um, so these guys now are really conquering the world in different industries, financials, uh, you know, social media, whatever it might be, payments and so forth. So my point is that, so yeah, 
that many, many ways, as from the government side, we, will really, we, we really have seen that we can get the digital economy, the digital business off the ground, if we, uh, you know, again, just by being a smart buyer. Um, I'll say a few words, just very briefly, about okay, what has been the backdrop. Okay, so us doing things digitally in government, what have been some of the foundations? And the reason why I talk about foundations is that from government point of view, we think that we are in a sort of infrastructure business. So uh, infrastructure in the sense that we see our role as providing an environment, which means uh, technical infrastructure, as well as sort of the legal infrastructure, legal environment, so that everybody can be digital in their sort of sector sphere or also in the government. The other part is to mention is that in our government, every minister is a digital minister in their field. So we need, and we have put in place common infrastructure that we, they can then reuse in their fields to really sort of, you know, be more effective in the digital innovation. And examples of that, first of all, one example is digital identity, which is really the core and the cornerstone of many things, uh, of all the sort of services in Estonia. So um, for us, digital identity means either an ID card that comes with a chip, that's actually an old version of that, uh, so on the chip, there's a certificate with which I can then make a secure authentication online. Or a mobile ID, which is basically, well, a SIM card, also, you know, with a special chip with, a, with the certificates. So that's this way I can authenticate myself on a mobile. And not just authenticate, but also authorize. I can sign things digitally in a secure way, which by our law is fully 100% equal to my handwritten signature. So it will hold in court essentially. So that means that, yes, we have a secure way for people to use the services online, but at the same time, we can fully move the whole cycle of service online, because again, there's nowhere a, a paper has to be issued at any point, even for authorization or signature. That can be handled digitally from a distance, wherever you are in the world. So basically, with, with signing, we sign everything digitally, literally. We, when I go abroad, I have to think, how does my paper signature work? Because uh, what, what was it? Because again, we just don't use it at all at home. Um, only places you would use it if you buy a property, physical property, or get married. <laughs> so for these two, we consider to be high risk transactions. So, uh, <laughs> so for that, we still make you, you know, you know, show up in person and sign and sign on paper. Although you don't need to sign on paper, but basically just for ceremonial reasons, right? Actually, if you buy a property and you go to uh, notary's office, they so, well, there the signing is digitally, but we may require you to show up because we want to make sure that you, know, you really are selling and buying a property. But anyways, so even these can be, as next stage, taken care of. So we might be able to offer digital marriages at some point. But the other, everything else, um, applications to the government, bank uh, transactions, uh, any bank transactions, contracts between business people, all of this, uh, um, Prime Minister sending a bill to the Parliament, all of this signed digitally, handled therefore fully digitally. So companies don't really meet to sign deals, they rather meet you know, to go to sauna, but, uh, but they can be anywhere in the world to get the business done. And as we have the identity for the, as the basis for that. And it is significant because, uh, just to bore you with one fact, then uh, we estimate, back of the envelope style, that we save, uh, we get an efficiency say, gain each year of 2% or more of GDP by signing things digitally in the whole of government, in the whole of economy. So basically we save a work week for every employee just by we don't have to go some places, you know, meet for signing, all that kind of stuff. We can be hopefully more productive, be, spend more time with our families, whatever, but that's a whole work week, if not more, each year. I think it's a bit off, but whatever. Um, so the other part, the other platform, which is really key, is that we have the ability, the platform for secure data exchange and interoperability across the whole public sector. So whatever part of data, whatever part of public sector, whatever agency, whatever information system, if they need to exchange data with somewhere else, we make them do it on, on a single platform. Now the platform is perhaps the wrong word because it's more like a set of common rules and, and standard and, and, and protocol. But uh, basically, exactly, same environment that they have to play in. And the point is that once they hook to, it's called X-Road. And so once they hook to X-Road once, all the next integrations are basically plug and play. They can just keep reusing that. So if you wish, it's like a, 
I think the analogy could be like a sort of uniform API sort of environment. And the point there is that um, for, for people, that's what they want. And they want, you know, they don't care about government silos. They, they want to get stuff done seamlessly from, you know, single window sort of encounter. Or the other point, uh, for government, just to serve people or even do a back office stuff, we need to put different bits of pieces of data together. So to do that securely and interoperably, especially, you know, as you know, there can be different sort of uh, technological solutions, different legacies in our sort of independent systems. So we need a common layer for that. And again, that's why we made it mandatory because that's why everybody can be interoperable as one example of being interoperable. And that is actually our government in action. So each day, all the sort of data flowing back and forth. And the reason why I show this is that from a technological point of view, so even if we you know, make everybody connect to each other, there's no single spot where every, all the traffic goes through. All the connections are end to end. So that means that basically from a cyber security point of view, it's very resilient. It's actually been even you know, tested in, in cyber attacks. Um, the point is that even if some node goes down, the rest stays up. So that's basically security we have built into from, from the architecture point of view. And like I said, it's always, let's say, infrastructure is not technological. So actually this technology, but it's the rules around that really make it powerful. So rules would be, for example, um, once only, or like in, like in, in Jersey here, tell us once. So uh, the point is that if government knows some data about me anyway, I should not be asked to present this again, which makes the service digitally also easier for me as a citizen, for example. Rather, we have to integrate in the back end. We have to reuse in the back end. So that forced the Estonian agencies to really start you know, on internet operability front. And the other part is, of course, but at the same time, look, if we can connect everything, is it, is it secure? Is it safe? Well, again, the legal side comes to the game or procedural side. So uh, in our law, we have very clear rules about who can connect to what. So you, if you can connect everything, basically, it's on a need to know basis, which is defined by specific you know, legal acts. Uh, for example, policemen, they have no business with my health record. They shouldn't get access to that. We have a nationwide medical history or medical health record in Estonia. Or my teacher has nothing to do with my you know, traffic violations, for example. So, you know, that's how we define who gets access to what, even if technologically we could share whatever with anybody. Um, and I think this is sort of, the, as a foundation, this is one of the further sort of things. I mean, it sounds trivial, but I mean, we've really seen the power of that, is that it's not about technology. I've heard this used here in Jersey too, but, but, but I really just want to emphasize that it's, it's really not... I mean, technology is the same basically everywhere. We all have access in a global market, right? To the same sort of stuff. Okay, different price, but still. But it's how we use it to really transform how we operate as a government in service delivery, but also in the back office. Now that makes a difference. So basically, we have, we have to re-engineer how we operate when delivering services or you know, when doing our sort of you know, governmental functions with technology. My, um, my good friend has a saying actually about that, is that, uh, look, what happens if you automate uh, stupidity? <laughs> Very fast, stupid decisions. <laughs> so that's the point exactly that, I mean, it's a bit overstated, but the point is that, so if you just don't change the procedure, we might make it automatic so a bit, or let's say make it digital, but we don't really get the benefits of efficiency, for example. So we can re if we redesign, that's when we reap the benefits. And it's been very core to Estonian sort of, um, you know, even high political sort of mindset. Uh, this is our cabinet in session. I mean, like I said before, they work digitally. Well, they could have simply put stuff, you know, in a sort of Dropbox kind of style for the folder back in the day. That would have been also like e-cabinet. And yes, the life would have been a bit easier, but not to the degree that they save time now. Also because they also connected them to other systems. They re-engineered the decision-making flow like that. That's the way they get the benefit. Or another example, I mean, tax, I talked about the tax declarations. Well, we could have put an online form up, right? You know, with all the right fields, basically digitize the paper tax declaration. That would have been an online service. But people would still spend a lot of time getting it done and sort of, you know, hire accountants. Instead, we thought, okay, let's re-engineer, let's connect sort of things in the back end and present data back to you. That's where the powerful efficiency comes from. So again, 
not just applying technology, but rethinking how we do things. It's easier said than done, but, but we try. And so, what other foundations have there been? Yes, I mean, we, I, I said how we've been enjoying the, really the growth of digital economy. Well, um, we had the luck, yes, that we, we had a bit of smarts to be a buyer, a smart buyer. Uh, we also had the luck that we had a uh, very uh, early success of Skype in the country, which had nothing to do with, with government. <laughs> but we really thought about those, these things, and so when we saw that, sort of, you know, out of that tech industry taking off, we said, okay, let's, let's bank on this, let's really now support the growth of this ecosystem. So we were doing various stuff, and I mean, these are just examples, but for example, we worked a lot with the um, um, industry association, right? To you know, get their views on board and you know, have them be a partner in sort of helping us to be a better procurement, uh, better sorcerer, basically. Or um, we set up um, a few years ago a um, development fund where I used to work, which was a public venture capital fund. So we didn't have enough venture capitalists in the, in the, in the country, so we set up uh, basically a joint investment fund uh, to support the growth of the industry. These days we run uh, like ecosystem platform, a bit like uh, like Digital Jersey here, except you know without a physical space. It's more about just, just you know, mentoring networks and other kind of stuff. Physical space is very similar. Garage 48 again, which private initiative we support because they do lots of hackathons and stuff and and so forth. So just a few examples, but we we try to do a lot across the whole chain of of, of company development to get more. First of all, to get more sort of uh, companies to, to, to be started or, or you know, more ideas in the market in the first place, but also for the next stages so that they will stay in Estonia at, at an additional measures. You know, investing in back in the day, now we do fund of fund stuff, uh, all the way to then just basically attracting foreign investment to, 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 yeah, as additional sort of layer. And what's more, this is nothing new in Jersey here and, and in digital Jersey hub especially, but uh, we have done a lot on the skills side, and this has really been the, 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 the fundamental part of policy, even more than digital government in a way. So over the years, um, back in the day, 90s, we started by um, something that's called Tiger Leap, which meant that we brought the internet to all the schools. You know, Netscape uh, had just come to the market, basically, when we started really sort of hooking schools up and you know, providing sort of computer classes there. Um, same way we brought the internet to all the sort of municipalities, all the government agencies. So really just, you know, give people the access and the, and the, and the, and the means to educate themselves. We co-invested with the private sector into basic literacy, digital, dig, digital literacy. So we went around the country, did trainings um, to some like 200,000 people, adults and elderly, just again that they would have the basic skills to use stuff online. And um, these days we we were one of the first in the world to do uh, coding for all uh, levels of, uh, of general education. So from uh, first grade, this guy says, I speak Java. So from first grade, they start learning the basics of computing, right? And all the way to then high school, when they're going really into special specialty uh, classes in coding. We worked on the university side. We brought the sort of better programs together. We uh, do a bit of, let's say, talent attraction from abroad. So really all in a sense that to get more skills in the market, and not just for you know, government or digital industry, but actually also for other industries. So that they would also be a smarter buyer and want to do more with technology, be it manufacturing, be it financial, be it retail, whatever. So yeah, skill is always sort of key part of policy because um, yeah, we really, that's our biggest barrier. We, we even with 1.3 million people, I say even only in Jersey, <laughs> uh, in, we, with 1.3 million people, we have way more ideas than people to do them with. So that's why we try to get more. And um, I've been talking too long, but I'll just say a few last words about what's next for us. Um, I think what I've been trying to say here is that I think we are also only scratching the surface. So there's lots more we should be doing uh, when it comes to using digital in government and also in the rest of the wider society. But starting from government, well, we have put stuff online, so yes, the stuff you can get done online, but now we're trying to really sort of re-engineer the services this way, that can we take the transactions, the transactional services at least, away by connecting even better the data and, and you know, even with a, you know, simple analytics like that. So most people have very simple wishes. They just come to us you know, on a regular basis with some very sort of simple stuff that we can, actually we could handle automatically for them. So uh, 
For example, if my, my child is born, government knows about this because hospital makes the entry to a population registry. So we immediately know that the kid was born. And we know the next steps. We don't need to do like user testing or an an analysis on that. We know that they will have to name the child. Uh, they will apply in most cases to some benefits. Put, they will apply for a kindergarten spot, all these things. These are available online, each and one of them. But let's say three, four, five different applications that people need to do. Whereas, actually, if the, if the kid is born, we know about this, why don't we just send an email and say, thanks for the new citizen, what's the name? Instead of you going online and telling us, we just say, come and ask you, right? And we could start sending you the money to your bank account, which we know from tax declaration, by the way. We could start doing that anyway, immediately, automatically. So, uh, or give you an option of, let's say, okay, which kindergarten you want to, get the want to put the kid in a queue uh, in. So, this doesn't require much analytics at all, actually, by the way. But if we then add to that, you know, the, the powers of, the, of uh, big data and so forth, this, you know, sky's the limit. But even by starting with small stuff, we could make people's life even more efficient than, than they are right now. Or another example that we're working on and piloting now uh, is for companies. So we see that we can bring radical efficiency to companies in their affairs. So um, basically, for companies who transact just electronically, uh, either cards or just uh, online transfers, the bank record is all that is actually necessary for the bookkeeping. Rest can actually be with very simple business rules, you know, uh, derived from that. So what we're trying to propose and develop now is that if the company is okay for our tax office to have access to the bank record, the company doesn't ever have to submit any declaration again to tax office or annual report or statistics for, for our statistical purposes. We would have the whole picture anyway. So, and they even included this with, let's say, whom are they making sort of uh, salary payments to, right? Even no, no need to submit uh, employment records. So, just by this integration through the private sector, the banks, and also to the government, we could take the need for accountants and sort of quite a lot of transactions away. And again, it would be on a voluntary basis because that's a bit of, let's say, some companies might not, might not want this, but at the same time, just to enable this, to allow those who want to be efficient, the option, we think it will be a great thing. And um, last slide, um, we also have opened up our services abroad. So we do a lot of work cross-border, working with other governments, connecting our infrastructures and, and a lot, you know, enabling services across the borders. But we also have another option that uh, we welcome everybody to come use our services. So we started with uh, e-residency, as it is called, which means that we issue our digital identity to those, anyone in the world who wants one. So basically, you know, all of you can apply as well and, and, and get the card if you like. We do run a background test though, check though. <laughs> so, um, and the whole point is that, so we are increasing our, use, increasing our user space. So we don't make enough babies. So we have to find other ways to do it, to scale up fast our population or, or digital space at least. So we're trying to bring this way more uh, users for the digital service providers in Estonia. And, uh, it's been ongoing since December 2014. We have about 10,000 people signed up. So that may not sound much, but uh, we were thinking, well, it's good if, you know, in the first year, 1,000 or 2,000 come. So in that sense, we are uh, over, over delivered <laughs> on the initial front. But the thinking is that also that we're hoping that this could be a platform to support new innovation. So we're working a lot with uh, some global companies already, some Estonian startups to really offer new more services on top of this. So which will also then be available domestically to Estonian residents. So it's not just opening up a user space, but really making this as a platform of, of transnational identity. And especially it's useful for transnational business. So anybody who wants to basically get stuff done digitally over distance in a hassle-free way. Um, I have spoken too long already. It's been a long day for all of us. So I think I will stop here, but uh, I'm very happy to take questions and, and engage in a bit of discussion. So thanks for now and, and, and shoot away. Yes. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah, so we were the first country in the world to be cyber attacked on a large scale, right? But uh, the point was, so, oh, so and your question was? Well, when, when they hit you guys, okay. allegedly, how did that hold up? Yes, yes, so that's why we, oh, sorry. Sorry, okay. So we are very proud of that. So it's actually, so it's battle tested <laughs> in a way. Um, first of all, something to, so the attacks that happened, uh, they were very simplistic in a sense. They were basically denial of service attacks, right? So just basically brute force to take the uh, services down. So as such, I mean, they were targeting mostly public oriented websites of banks, uh, utilities, uh, government, so forth. Now the point is that uh, because of the distributed nature of, of the infrastructure or architecture rather, then uh, yes, some parts went down. I don't know, like you know, some websites or some services because of that might have been down. Not the registers or not the, not the databases, but the frontline interface. But the rest of it was still operational because still, I mean, for, you know, I mean, you have to go by brute force behind each and one of them. And even in a small place like Estonia, in a way, this is a really hard thing to do, especially back in 2007. Right? So, um, so basically what I'm trying to say is that yes, it's panel tested because we saw really the benefits of distributed sort of ways of working and, and infrastructure and, and uh, we do work a lot, of course, beyond that. It's not just the architecture side. So we invest a lot into cybersecurity also in terms of you know, prevention, uh, reactive capacity uh, in government cert and so forth and so forth. I can talk more about that, but, but yeah, it, we are proud that we were never down as a government. Some individual services and sites were down, but not the whole of government and, and, and not the most of government even. Yeah, yeah sure. So, um, <coughs> the x ray kind of data bus, or whatever you want to call it, um, you said that the government isn't really wanting to build services, they try and get third parties to do it for them and use that. I assume that the government at some point decided the specification of that, or mm -hmm. was that in conjunction with the commercial business? It's been uh, in conjunction in a way. So exactly, even extra is built by outside vendors, if that's what you're asking, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, it came out of uh, academic research, by the way, back in the day, that then spilled over and became uh, like exactly like a corporate effort afterwards by, by several companies these, at, at this point. So and these guys now have taken this to other countries in the world too, right? Uh, most recently, Finland. So Finland is using the same sort of extra platform now for their whole uh, government, for example. Yeah. Did the majority of the infrastructure, when you were building all out in history, uh, was it built by local providers, or did you get those external providers in? Uh, it was well, they were external to the government, but mostly local in terms of origin, right? Again, not on purpose, purposefully. So we cannot uh, we cannot discriminate between EU at least, right, or within EU at least. But uh, <coughs> first of all, um, we rarely find right stuff on the market. So that's one thing. And so, I mean, these as we try to procure it this way that, you know, we would do a bit integration perhaps, or let's say, find pockets and products and pieces to integrate, uh, even, sometimes even, even by ourselves. But if you want the whole package, then we usually buy custom made. And that means, you know, by default that, you know, somebody with a contacts has to be there as well. Especially as we buy uh, not just the cost, but value for money. So lots of things go into factoring this. Who's the winner? Yeah. Are there any aspects of Estonian government or life that you'd want to keep off the X-ray? Secret services. Yeah, that sort of stuff, nat national security. Yeah, but that's actually it. That's about it. Yeah. So the other thing is that also, let's say, um, we don't mandate you to go on there if you don't need any data exchange. Right? So for example, if it's, I don't know, I don't have a good example to give you because everybody does, but uh, if it would be just very standalone information system, right? Just to do, I don't know, sitting in one office, just doing one stuff, right? We wouldn't mandate you go on there. But if once you start transacting, we make you adhere to the platform, right? But yeah, secret service uh, we don't put in here. So, uh, so I mean, they they run their own stuff basically. They also run on. Oh, the other thing I should have told. That's actually new for you as well, perhaps. This runs on public internet. So basically, that's another thing. I mean, we didn't want to build our own sort of government, uh, you know, communication networks, except for secret services, okay. right? Yes. I recall was it last year there was some security issues for smart cards, and this is now sort of 10, 15 years old. If you were starting again today, like Jersey might be, yeah, what would you do differently? Well, first of all, uh, are you referring to the Google case? Well, I think, yeah, there was a. 
yeah, 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 basically, yeah, right, yeah. That's a good question because that's actually a good example. So I mean, even in our case, I mean, so a bit of legacy comes up. So the issue there was that the certificates we have put on, actually Google did not recognize anymore. So we are now rolling over basically like, uh, like renewal of the certificates for them. It's actually going live this week. <laughs> so very good question. Uh, but that, that wasn't a security issue. It was rather the issue of, you know, uh, interoperability with a particular browser in a way, right? But it was, I guess, partially an element of having physical smart cards, yeah. so it's physical renewal yeah. rather than software renewal. We are, no, actually we, no, actually we do renew the certificate on the chip uh, decently, in a sense, so you don't need to show up physically unless you want to. But the other part, and because that wasn't the heart of the question, so the other part was that um, if we start today, yes, I wouldn't do cards at all. Uh, that's actually nothing to do with security, in a sense, but rather usability. So, um, yes. Laptops, they come with a USB uh, port and, and, and in my case a, a card reader built in. But the point is, tablets, where do you stick the card? Nowhere. Or phones, you know, which is how people tra uh, transact these days. So that's why, I mean, these days, I would say mobile ID is the minimum. But of course, then the question is which sort of mobile ID? So we have a SIM card face, but even that we have to phase out in a few years, we know. So we are now trying to develop an alternative because uh, you know, Apple and everybody else are getting rid of SIM cards, right? So probably we will try to need to figure out some other way, app paste or whatever for that. And what we are exploring from our side, but this is not like, like mature technology yet, is biometry. Could really me be the carrier uh, of, of, you know, or this is the first factor in a way. And then just like with my, my card, basically it comes with pins. That's the second factor. So then I would have the second factor with the pins attached. But fundamentally, my first factor would be my fingerprint, iris, whatever like that. But yeah, it's... Um, we are exploring this, but we don't see uh, technology, uh, let's say, is widely spread and, and mature enough really to, to roll it out yet. But it will have to come. Yeah. So you see that as a challenge, <coughs> sorry, going forward, is Microsoft are changing its cadence for Apple where they get regular updates, they can do something that can affect you. That's, well, that, that's, that was exactly the case with Google. So, I mean, uh, so what we have worked a lot is now that uh, in the really sort of established. Uh, even as small as we are, establish direct lines of communication, right, with, you know, all the global players of the world. First of all, trying to make, make them understand that, you know, they should care about us. <laughs> and second, also that, you know, we would, we, would, we would learn fast enough when something new comes out. So we've had lots of issues, for example, with Apple in the past, which is basically issued new versions without telling really developer community much at all, right? So we had to, always, you know, rush them to once they came up with a new OS, uh, then we had to rush to re then come up with a new sort of software client right away in just a few weeks. So now we have a bit of more, let's say, advanced announcement. Right? <coughs> with Google, the case was six months, so that's enough to design a solution. Yeah. So there you go. <coughs> you, uh, you mentioned every minister is a digital minister in their field, <coughs> by which I seem to mean they've got a, an understanding of of the digital issues. We, have we, much we, 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 ex we expect them to, I would say yeah. this way. <laughs> I mean, we, have, we, we have a much the same here, a common understanding <laughs> amongst the ministers. So, what, to, what, to what extent, as in the day happening, to what extent is that <laughs> a. Uh, that deadpan. <laughs> <sarcastic. laughs> <laughs> to, to what extent is that a uh, sort of a key part of the ingredient to actually make this happen? Yeah. Uh, rather than all the, the, the bits and pieces and the bits of kit, but the, the, the tone at the top and the, the near top. Very much so, and I mean, um, and it really, I think there are two parts to your question in a way. I don't know if you intended it this way. <laughs> but uh, first of all, yes, I mean, uh, in our case, the digital sort of government, or let's say, well, just digital society building has really much been you know, very strongly politically leadership-wise supported and, and driven even, right? Ever since the early days when we started with the first of experiments, because I was really like, yeah, the leaders had no other ideas how to become more efficient, especially in the backdrop of some uh, late 90s financial crisis. So when we had to cut budgets a lot. So yes, very much been politically driven. And by this point, the debate is not about, you know, whether or if to be digital, but are we doing enough? So, and, and in, you know, in whatever sort of areas. So it's, it's like a, let's say we have coalition governments. So uh, coalition or opposition doesn't matter. The debate is, you know, about that part. So some parties, of course, are very digitally driving, some a bit more sort of laid back, right? So if we had a change of government, you know, we would perhaps the, the, <laughs> the intensity of the drive would be different, but it would be there, is what I'm trying to say. Do you find that there's still any, any part of society which is resistant to the whole e-government thing? 
Not really, if I'm honest with you. Uh, so I mean, that that very interesting because I've seen how how difficult it's been with my with my mother, who's 80, mm -hmm. trying to get her online and trying to get her using the computer. It's a nightmare. Sure, but but say. Uh, I don't want to generalize this into a group. Yes, of course, we do have people, like in all age groups, actually, who are you know, a bit more resistant, right, for whatever reasons, whether they're afraid, skills, disability, whatever, right? But the point is that, but especially with the elderly, and, and some of you have heard this, but um, th the trick was for us to figure out, or is to figure out individually all the time, you know, what's, what could be the trigger with them? So we thought, with, so a lot of us was that how do we raise motivation? So how do we raise awareness about what can you do online? So, um, when we, were, when we were basically training all the sort of, you know, adult, let's say many adult people in Estonia, a lot of it was not about, let's say, trying to teach them skills, but showing them what can they do. Yeah. And it was small stuff sometimes. Uh, reading a newspaper online, doing a banking online, uh, being able to uh, see your grandchildren over Skype. So stuff that got them hooked. And then, as that meant regular practice, then they were eager to add sort of, you know, we were able to add other sort of skills, on to, let's say, uses on top of that. But yeah. I take a point that I mean individuals differ. So I mean I have it the same way with uh, with they're now deceased, but you know with my grandfather and grandmother. Grandmother couldn't get less. <laughs> grandfather was very eager. He was 83 and sort of you know uh, going online first time. So because he found a motivation for that finally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mine, mine, mine isn't unenthusiastic, but she really really struggles with the complexity of it all. Right, and that's and I think that's actually you're quite right. I think that goes a long way. So. Uh, we also see now that we have 90% of people online in Estonia, uh, young and old together. So, or, or sorry, adults, uh, young and old together. So for the last 10%, we are now trying to really sort of see, okay, we, sh we have to radically make our services, at least from government side, intuitive enough, so that they would be able to use them. And secondly, uh, what we're trying thinking about is that can we invest into um, different modes of interaction? So what I'm particularly having in mind is that so, uh, we are trying to see that can we use actually language synthesis and recognition uh, to 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 and offer service digitally, but without any sort of other sort of interface or stuff like that. If it, so, this is really early on in the in the stage, but yeah, we're, we're keen to experiment on that front. So you're doing something artificial intelligence based text to speech, speech, speech or text. Well, not not necessarily even AI based, but basically even very simple stuff, right? I mean, so. Uh, you know, if, if most transactions are very simple, yes and no, I don't input, uh, your address, address is wrong, we don't ask for address in Estonia, but I don't know, input some very sort of simple thing, right? I don't so, do you want to retire? Yes, no, sort of stuff. Okay, that will automate away. So, we are keen to experiment in this space, especially as there's one more thing. <coughs> this is again an industry supporting measure. <laughs> so, we have our own funny little language called Estonian. <laughs> so, only one million people speak this in the world. So. Basically, we are also keen that as we do these experiments on the service side, hopefully our language is able to survive better in a digital world. So this is also like a public good sort of investment. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you persuade banks to join your next road and platform? And would other countries or someone like here have a hope in any to get third-party banks to right. join it? Well, um, with it, see, they join if they have a business interest. Right, so basically it comes down to let's say other procedures where this sort of connection would be beneficial for them as well. So uh, with the banks, the example that we have them here is, I think in this case it's the other way around. Um, they have an interest to serve their clients and the particular case with them is that so we have, we have a very simple tax system in Estonia, but so one thing you can get a deduction on is mortgage payment interest. So, uh, sorry, mortgage interest payments. <laughs> So um, this means that, you know, for example, if it's tax day, people want to have this information on the record. So that's why, I mean, they were happy to interview because people were sort of asking for that in a sense, right? But also, extra is just one, or another area. Um, we have a very cool uh, project now with uh, electricity sector. So basically all the utilities, electricity utilities providers, they now set up their internal billing and sort of um, production sharing and all these sort of data flows on top of x -road among themselves. So basically, you know, different utility companies just exchange on, on light version of x -road among themselves. Again, because they thought, okay, we need to integrate. Do we build something on our own or we just reuse the common infrastructure? So it made business sense for them to reuse that, right? 
But where we have the banks, and this has been even more crucial, is been ID. So Digital ID, I should have said this, was built by a consortium of uh, government, banks and telcos back in the day. And it's actually still being, I mean, the certification authority is still a consortium of them. So uh, effectively providing this as a common service for everybody. Yeah. And the reason why they joined was that, um, well, first of all, they needed to build their own authentication mechanism otherwise. And they thought, what the hell? This is just too costly. Might as well pull resources together and you know take one cost line away, the cost line away. So crude financial calculation on their behalf. But um, some things they don't join up. So uh, somebody asked me this, but uh, in my wallet I still have my bank cards. I don't need to. I shouldn't need to because uh, actually, well, if my ID card comes with a chip, I could just have the same functionality here but my bank still wants to be in my wallet with their brand. <laughs> you know, basically as it's real estate, I'm, you know. So there they don't have a business interest strong enough. Even if they could take the cost away of the cards of their own, they just find additional thing more uh, attractive. So yeah, with financial sector, you guys know this anyway, but it's, it's about the money. <laughs> Figuring out what, what to make it financially lucrative. So with citizen IDs in place early on, you talked about the foundation. Yes. Yes. So uh, what we started doing is that so uh, <coughs> we started experimenting on, on two sides at once. The platforms, because we very well figured out what could be the joint to the platform needs, like data exchange, ID, uh, etc. And the first services, uh, making them digital, right? So basically, two things were sort of work, progressing iteratively. As we were bringing sort of uh, services online, we started also experimenting with digital ID in that, or data exchange in that. So if that makes sense, yeah. And I should say one thing, I mean, uh, in our Estonian case, um, why we are a bit special is that in our case, an ID card is mandatory. So you have to have the card. Even if you don't use it digitally, you have to have it. Yeah. But also because it's a physical ID, so 